Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with Geography. Now, we're on to Mongolia. Uh, this is the home, is Gang home of Genghis Khan, right? And Mongols? I mean, Mong Mongols, Mongolia, I mean, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, uh, this is going to look really sleek. I'm totally wrong. But, uh, yes, uh, I know where, know where you guys are located. I kinda, you guys are, like, basically between China and Russia, right? I, mean, I, think, it, I think that's right. But uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button below. Please and thank you. And yeah, let's jump into this video. I better hear something about Genghis Khan or I'm going to be extremely disappointed. Eventually, I'm going to do an entire series on uh, Genghis Khan. But eventually, down the line. Not quite yet, though. Now, you guys know I'm half Korean. If you don't know much about East Asia, basically putting aside all the political differences, at the end of the day, the nearly two billion of East Asians, like Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese, are distant cousins. Then little Mongolia comes in with less than three million people and they step on the scene and it's like, oh, hey, hey, grandpa. What? It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. You may have heard a little bit about this guy, mostly through the massive empire from Genghis Khan, or Genghis Khan. But Mongolia is unique in that it's kind of like the kindred root that billions of people stem from all over the world. And it all starts on some grassy hills that we will locate in... Mongolia is known as the land of the eternal blue sky as they get over 250 sunny days a year. They really are kind of like the center of Asia. Even though technically the actual geographic center of Asia is claimed by three spots, two in Russia, one in China. But Mongolia is really close to all three of them. Anyway, Mongolia is a landlocked country, the 18th largest in the world, located in center East Asia, bordered by Russia and China. Yes. If it wasn't for this very narrow 23 mile long corridor, they would also touch Kazakhstan, but they don't. The country is divided into 21 provinces or Aymags, with the capital Ula I know I know this is unrelated, but I like the TV show Alone. It's about it's a survive and it's a reality TV surviving show. I think that was I think one of the season was recorded in Mongolia, if I if I remember correctly. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think so. But definitely check out that TV show. It's a great TV show. Anyways. They don't. The country is divided into 21 provinces or Aymags with the capital Ulaanbaatar, meaning Red Hero in the northeast, acting as its own municipality with provincial status. Literally all roads in the country eventually lead up to this one city, one way or another. Oh, and it has this really okay. cool looking curved sky tower building. Fun fact, Ulaanbaatar, spelled a variety of different ways depending on how you look at it, is the world's coldest capital and it was actually a nomadic city that moved 28 times before settling in its current location. The city in itself holds about 45% of the entire Entire country's population and holds the only international airport, Genghis Khan International. And a new airport is being built on the other side of the mountain, so far just called New Ulaanbaatar International. It has <laughs> almost nothing around it, so good luck. Otherwise, the second and third largest <laughs> cities are Erdenet and Darhan, located relatively close to Ulan. All right, there's nothing around you, but I'm sure there's got to be some kind of like reasoning behind this. I mean, I'm sure they're going to end up, you know building around it obviously you think right i mean you're not just gonna have an airport you have to drive like a couple hours to get into town i'm sure they're gonna the plan is to kind of build city around it kind of thing i don't know maybe you guys let me know in the comments anyways Otherwise, the second and third largest cities are Erdenet and Darhan, located relatively close to Ulaanbaatar. Now, Mongolia is kind of interesting because although they don't have territorial disputes, they do have some interesting border demarcations, such as the narrow western slot of Lake Buir shared with China. Russia gets a small slice of Uf's Lake. On the east, you can find a tripoint monument for China, Russia, and Mongolia at Tarbaganda, and plans for a possible western tripoint marker on the peak of Mount Tabambogdo Ula are on the way. The country has a main railway that transects the north north to south, entering both Russia and China. This also connects to the larger well-known Trans-Siberian Railway in Russia. More lines are planned to be built in the future, but for now, almost the entire western part of Mongolia is only accessible by crude roads and paths or, you know, horse trail. Yeah, we'll get into the horse thing later. Anyway, now when I say Mongolia, obviously I'm referring to what constitutes the boundaries of modern day state Mongolia. Keep in mind though, historically, the regions of what are now Inner Mongolia that belong to China or the People's Republic of China were part of the larger Mongolia region 
and today has more ethnic Mongols than actual Mongolia. Coming to Mongolia, you'll probably be hit with a lot of interesting sites, especially with Genghis Khan. You know him, he's everywhere. Statues, buildings, carvings on hillsides. The airport what? is actually named after him. He's even on their money. Some notable sites of interest might include places like all these museums, the Bod Palace, Ich Berhant Complex, the Taihar Stone, the Shambhala Stupa structure. The locals kind of consider it like the center of energy for the universe. Of course, there are so many hundreds of different monasteries like these, including the oldest one, Erdenezu. And of course, there's the Pride and Glory statue, the Sonjin Bulldog Genghis Khan statue. But the thing Mongolia is probably known most for is not the handmade landmarks, but rather the vast open expanses of grassland where all the power began. Which brings us to... Yeah. Remember that universal wallpaper for all windows monitors back in like 1997? Oh, yeah. It had that serene rolling green hill. That's kind of what comes to mind when I think of Mongolia's landscape. Fun fact, it got converted into a vineyard. Anyway, Mongolia lies on the center of Asia, sandwiched between the Gobi Desert in the south, and there are three main small mountain chains. The Altai in the west, where you can find the tallest peak, Hutian, on the border with China. The Hangai Mountains in the north, where you can find the deepest freshwater lake, Hovsgol. However, the hypersaline lake, Uvs, has more surface area. In between these two mountain chains lies the Valley of Lakes, where most of Mongolia's natural lakes lie. And finally, the Hentil in the north, which is where the longest river, the Orhon, flows, sourced by Lake Baikal in the Buryat Republic of Russia. Okay. Basically, if you want the overall summary, the south is a dry, cold desert, the north is greener and hillier with grassy hills and water, and the entire country is subjugated to the massive atmospheric pressure zone known as the Siberian Anticyclone. This is a huge, cold, dry air mass with massive pressure that accumulates between September and April, usually centered around Lake Baikal, and it grows as far as Italy in the west and Malaysia to the south. In a nutshell, huh. this is what keeps Mongolia generally windier and chillier, even though they get lots of sunshine with little snow. Basically, it's a very dry landmass, and the rainiest spots only get about 14 inches of rain a year at best. Weird, right? Dry but cold. In fact, the only natural disaster that they face would be the Zud, or a harsh climactic condition that causes massive yeah. amounts of livestock to die off due to freezing conditions and starvation. Also keep in mind, the Gobi Desert is the source of the eastern winds that causes all the dust storms that fly all the way across Eastern Asia. In the Korea episode, I explained this. It's called Hwangsa. All right, this is my uh, triple shot of espresso break. Usually Noah comes in, but his car broke down, so he can't make it here. Ken, just, dish, just take over. Just take over. Come on, I'm Noah. Out. Okay. Mongolia is known for being very big and empty, which makes it perfect for animals to graze. In terms of wildlife, Mongolia is a horse haven. They're often seen as a national animal. There's even a wind horse in their emblem. And just like we discussed in other Central Asian country videos, the horse has played such a huge role in Mongolian history from transport, riding, food, milk, and sport. It is estimated that about 13 times more horses and 30 times more sheep live in the country than actual people. In fact, Mongolia is the home of the last truly wild horses in the world known as Taki. The horses have have 66 chromosomes, two more than your average horse. Otherwise, the famous two hump Bactrian camel are also national treasures. They even have a festival devoted to them. Other species like the Saiga antelope and their weird noses roam around the grassland and about one third of the world's snow leopard population lives in Mongolia. But Ken, what about their economy? Don't they have like a bunch of minerals or something? Yes, they do. Mongolia focuses on two main industries, herding and mining. Minerals make up about 80% of their exports, mostly in gold and copper. However, both sectors have been in decline for the past decades in favor of service jobs. Mongolia is also the second largest producer of cashmere goat wool in the world after China. They have the second largest population of yaks, again, after China, which they use for milk and dairy. Speaking <laughs> of which, food. First of all, no. Mongolian beef barbecue is a Chinese invention. It is not authentic Mongolian food. You have authentic dishes like arul, which is dehydrated curdled milk cheese. You have the national drink, airag, which is a fermented milk often from horses. Baked sheep meat called horhog, bodog, which is this inside out cooked meat thing. And finally, huh? booze dumplings. Yeah, a lot of meat and dairy. It's just part of their culture. And Our speaking of dairy. culture... Thank you, Ken. Mm, interesting. You sound really enthusiastic when you do these things. You, you like doing this, don't you? I am enthusiastic. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, get back to the camera. Okay. <laughs> now, growing up with Korean culture, I was always kind of under the influence that Mongolians are kind of like the mystical ancestors of all East Asians, and there's kind of a tincture of truth to that. First of all, the country has about 3.1 million people and is the most sparsely populated sovereign state in the world with only about two people per square kilometer. The vast majority of the country, at about 95%, identify as Mongolian, or one of the main Mongolian people groups, like the Buryats, or Dorbod, Bayad, and 
and so on, whereas the remaining 5% come from a variety of minorities, mostly Kazakhs and Russians. They use the Mongolian Togrog as their currency, they use the type C and E plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now, what does it mean to be Mongolian in the 21st century? Well, for one, the language. Mongolian is a unique tongue spoken with some interesting glottal stop sounds, strangely enough, kind of similar to the ones that you find in the Inuit areas of the Arctic. Here's a clip from Easy Languages. I love these guys. They do such great street interviews. Check them out. <laughs> And keep in mind, there isn't just okay. one type of Mongolian, but rather a few distinct cousin groups like the Altai, the Buryats, the Kalmyks, mostly found in modern-day Russia or the Inner Mongolian regions of China. Each has a distinct dialect and tradition. Some speak completely unintelligible Turkic-based languages, but overall, they're all cousins. Geography Ongor said, if you locked a Mongolian, Buryat, Kalmyk, Inner Mongolian, and a Tuvan in a room, it would look kind of like this. <laughs> What? What are your hobbies, Kalmykia? I like to drawing pictures. What, what about you, Tuva? Uh, me like having this for... Yeah, Tuva would probably have a little more trouble communicating, but they're all definitely family. Now, the interesting thing is that okay. although Mongolia has always kind of been like a lightly populated nation, it's always been the genetic source for billions of people. How did this happen? Well, in a nutshell, the Mongolian Empire, you may have heard of it. Although anthropologists have been able to trace East Asian ancestry originally through the human migration patterns that passed through India and the Middle East, the Mongolian invasions of the 13th century greatly shifted the genetic structure for what would become billions of people. Geneticists have been able to trace the Y chromosome common protogenor in at least 17 million people alone that are directly descended from Genghis Khan. And that's just one Mongolian. Pretty interesting. Wow. Otherwise, in terms of faith, a little over half the population adheres to Buddhism, introduced shortly after the Mongolian Empire collapsed during the Yuan dynasty. Just something like that makes me want to get one of those uh, is it ancestry kind of DNA tests, or what is it called, where you kind of see what kind of background it is. Here we are. I should definitely do that. That'd probably be an interesting video. But I need to like, write that down and get on top of that. Anyways, back to the video. It'd be kind of cool to see what your ancestry is. For half the population adheres to Buddhism, introduced shortly after the Mongolian Empire collapsed during the Yuan Dynasty in China in the late 13th century. About a third are either traditional shaman or non-religious, and the remainder are mostly Christian or Muslim, especially the Kazakh people being Muslim. Mongolia today writes mostly in the Cyrillic alphabet. They adopted it in the 1940s during Soviet times. However, prior to that, they actually had their own writing system known as Hudum Mongol Bichik. It was written vertically left to right, inspired off the old Uyghur writing system. It almost went out of use, but today it has been reintroduced in schools and is trying to revive itself. Today you can see it on road signs and even in Inner Mongolia they use it as a script as well. Culture wise there are too many things to list but one thing you need to understand is that to this day like many other Central Asian peoples about a third of the entire country is still nomadic or semi-nomadic choosing to live in yurt communities, housing made up of traditional circular living structures that can easily be broken apart and transported. They are huge on wrestling or boh. They even have the world's largest wrestling event in the July game event known as Nadam with over 6,000 competitors, no weight class, and it gets intense. The traditional style comes in many different forms, but essentially the men wear briefs, boots, and a zodog, or bare-chested jacket. As the legend goes, there was one occasion in which a woman beat all the wrestlers, ripping her jacket in the process, exposing her breasts, and since then, all the jackets were made to expose the chest of the wrestlers to make sure none of them were women. Otherwise, horse riding and archery are huge. Traditional Mongolian dance comes in a variety of styles, many inspired by the movements. I was wondering, like, why just the arms and but then they they totally explained it that's definitely interesting the woman kicked butt and destroyed the men so if like six thousand people enter that is it like a like a tournament like winter goes on until you're kind of finally down to the you know and down to just two people is that kind of how it works that seems like it would take a long time but then again it might not take that long if you have you're, all this is going on like a big field at once kind of thing I mean, that's definitely something interesting to kind of to kind of see though anyways and archery are huge traditional mongolian dance comes in a variety of styles many inspired by the movements of animals like the falcon dance or the prancing lion dance another huge deal would be the traditional throat singing i have been waiting so long to cover this because it is so cool basically if you've never heard it it's essentially a singing style called overtone singing which is done with two tones at once with the mouth the regular voice and the second one with an almost eerie sounding whistle for example do that it's like 
Very Otherwise, Zed-like. Mongolia is huge on festivals. They have them throughout the entire year. Things like Sagan Sar, Mongolian New Year, with lots of fatty meat served. They have the Ice Festival, the Golden Eagle Festival, oh, and so man. on. Okay, time to move on. History, in the quickest way I can put it. Proto-Mongolic Khanates. Mongolian tribes unify under Genghis Khan and the Mongolian Empire. Mongolian Empire split up into four separate Khanates. China starts coming in. Mongolians convert to Buddhism, some to Islam. Also during this period, the Kalmyks moved to Kalmykia, which is now part of Western Russia. Nearly two centuries of rule under the Qing Dynasty. A lot of political marriages between Mongols and Manchus. Late 19th century Han Chinese immigrants move into inner and outer Mongolia. 1911, Mongolia declares independence. Shortly after World War I, Mongolia decides to side with Russia and remove Chinese occupation. 1932, Monk Rebellion, Stalin's Purge. They act as like a buffer for Russia and China during Sino-Soviet split. 1991, Mongolia becomes a democratic country. New buildings and pop culture comes in. And here we are today. Some notable people of Mongolian descent or from Mongolia might include Modu Chanyu, Tan Shi Huai, Genghis Khan, or uh, this might be a this, this might be a stupid question. Okay, is it, you know Demer? Uh, so you guys aren't communists, you know, kind of like communist countries like Russia and China. Does that feel weird being between them? Then you know, and just just you know, just asking. I don't I don't think I don't think we were at weird at all. I just it'd just be kind of different, right? I told you it was a stupid question. Anyways. Or Genghis Khan, obviously, and the various Khans that followed after him. Sorgaktani Beki, the fourth Dalai Lama, Vachim and this poet guy, Myangat, D. Dagba Dorj, Natak Dorj, Jugvarsin, the cosmonaut, this guy. <laughs> yeah, a Mongolian person went up to space. And speaking of the grand scope of the world. <laughs> Now, Mongolia did have the second largest empire throughout all of history, right after the British. So they've always kind of had a way of dealing with a lot of people across the world, I guess you could say. Outside of Asia, Germany and the USA have close ties. They're one of the few countries that had consulates in the early 20th century. They have the largest communities of Mongolians abroad in diaspora. They are also countries where Mongolians prefer to work and travel wow. to. And about 2% of the population can speak German today. And many are learning English as well. Mongolia kind of has a little bit of a crush on South Korea and Japan. Pop culture. And and dramas are super popular. Tons of Koreans and Japanese restaurants are everywhere. And the two are super comfortable when they meet each other. Many Mongolians also have taken part in sumo wrestling, including this guy who became Yokozuna. Kazakhstan and Turkey are kind of like the newer but technically old friends as they see Mongolia as kind of like an ancestor to their people. Both have great interest and respect whenever the word Mongolia is brought up. In terms mm. of their best friends, however, many Mongolians might say Russia because okay. they didn't want China to overtake them. Although Mongolia never became a Soviet Republic, they did kind of act as like a buffer zone between the two countries, especially during the Sino-Soviet split. To okay. this day, many Mongolians even speak Russian, Russians come in all the time, and the two nations have just been generally very close, especially during the turn of the 20th century. In conclusion, with Mongolia, you have a very vast open space inhabited by few people, but these people hold a very important secret that Asia could not live without. Stay tuned, Montenegro wow. is coming up next. Well, I'm sorry about the, you know, being, uh, being different about uh being neighbors with russia when apparently you guys are best friends so definitely apologize about that but definitely cool and interesting you kind of like korea you know as like a big influence you know because not really close by i guess i guess they're, cool. they're all in asia right but yeah as i i de just de definitely think it's kind of a really interesting dynamic that longolia has got going on and it's just really interesting and cool and yeah uh, does has I guess it's like has everyone in Mongolia uh, riding a horse is like because you know it's like a big you know horse country is it one of those things where like if you're not if you're one of those people who've never ridden a horse like people like look down on you maybe I, I don't know maybe some of them in Mongolia can let me know you know is like horse riding like a big thing or is it you know not really I don't know let me know in the comments below by the way please hit that like and subscribe below. And hope you continue the journey with me for every country in the world. Uh, and yeah, very awesome video. Very interesting. And Mongolia, very awesome, unique country. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a theme around here. Just learning some cool stuff. And yeah, just awesomeness. But anyways, peace. Catch you guys in future videos. Always a blast. Hope you guys have an amazing day or amazing night. And I'm out of here. See you later.